version of the Old Testament reading, we will sing the gradual. The word gradual is the word for step. In the old, early church, when the pastor would, uh, after say, saying the words of the Old Testament, he would step up to read the New Testament, reminding us that we are in a new covenant. The Old Testament lesson hour is from the prophet Isaiah, the 45th chapter. This is what the Lord says to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I take hold of, to subdue nations before him, and to strip kings of their armor, to open doors before him, so that gates will not be shut. I will go before you, and will level the mountains. I will break down gates of bronze, and cut through bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness, riches stored in secret places, so that you may know that I am the Lord, the God of Israel, who summons you by name. For the sake of Jacob, my servant, of Israel, my chosen, I summon you by name and bestow on you a title, title of honor, though you do not acknowledge me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. Apart from me, there is no God. I will strengthen you, though you have not acknowledged me, so that from the rising of the sun to the place of its setting, men may know there is none besides me. I am the Lord. And there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I bring prosperity and create disaster. I, the Lord, do all these things. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. 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 
This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We pray. Lord, we pray that your grace may always proceed and follow us, that we may continually be given to good works. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Chose that hymn that we just sang, God moves in a mysterious way, because no more is it placed in it uh, as evident as in uh, our Old Testament reading for this Sunday, the Isaiah 45 text. And uh, you may notice we have green, not red, up here, even though most of our sister congregations are celebrating Reformation today. Uh, as it says in your book, the Reformation Day observed. Uh, I chose to uh, go ahead and do our 22nd Sunday after Pentecost. Every once in a while I do this because uh, with the way the church calendar runs, sometimes these readings that, like the Matthew 22, render on to Caesar, we don't get to hear because they're in later part of the church year and they always get interrupted by Reformation Day, next Sunday is All Saints Day, right? And then we start in Advent, and so sometimes we don't get to hear these texts. And so, and besides the fact we're having our own Reformation service on Tuesday, plug, plug, plug. Uh, at 7 o'clock, be there or be square. You get to wear red, you'll see red, and we can have a full-blown celebration of that. But there is a connection, I would argue, between the 22nd Sunday readings and, and Reformation Day anyway, and that is, again, that God works in mysterious ways, and uh, again, like I said, no more mysterious than in the Isaiah Old Testament text. If you don't know this, uh, Isaiah's makes this prophecy about Cyrus, the king of Persia, hundreds of years before Cyrus ever arrives on the scene. It is such an amazing miracle that most liberal scholars use this as proof that there's more than one author of Isaiah, because Isaiah could not have known the guy's name. Come on. That would be a miracle. Well, that's right. We believe in those things, don't we? Obviously, they don't. But that he used, and that's amazing in itself, right? But what's even more amazing is what he calls Cyrus. He calls him his anointed. That term ought to ring some bells in your head if you've been in my classes, right? What does the word Messiah or Christ mean? The anointed one. Isaiah, God through Isaiah, calls Cyrus his Messiah. And in a particular sense, he is a savior for God's people. That's what he's promising here. Even though Cyrus does not acknowledge it, he can't, of course, when Isaiah makes the prophecy, and later on, Cyrus is not a believer necessarily, right? He's a pagan. But God works through this pagan to deliver his people. God works in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. He's working behind the scenes to accomplish salvation for the sake of the preaching of his word and that people would come to know the true Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, when he would enter into the world and take upon himself his saving mission to redeem us from our sins. And so God works in this way that we would not ever fully expect. And Jesus makes this point also in our gospel lesson. I don't know if you caught it or not. But when they come to him with this question about whether it's right to pay taxes to Caesar or not, they hope they've got him. That they put him in a no-win situation, right? Because if he says... Yes, you should pay taxes to Caesar. Then he hopes his followers will see him and view him as a traitor to the Jewish people and the cause of being free from Rome. On the other hand, if he says, no, you shouldn't pay taxes to Caesar, who do you think they're going to go tell? Caesar. And then he will be taken away as a disturber of the peace by the Romans. Crafty, huh? They got him, right? Not so fast. Okay? And so Jesus says, bring me a coin. 
And they bring him to Denarius. And he says, whose portrait is this? And whose inscription? And they have to say, Caesar's. He's trapped them. They, have, they can't say it's God's. And so they have to admit the coinage they use for their survival comes from all places but a pagan like Caesar, like Cyrus. And that God can work even through that. Pretty cool, huh? Now, there is a sense, of course, right? When you hear this, we say what? When he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar and to God what is God. If there was a smart aleck among them, he could have said, well, everything belongs to God. I don't know how that helped their cause. But it is true. We're going to say in a few moments why I chose it. We give thee but thine own. Whatever the gift may be, everything belongs to God. But the point is here that God works through these means to accomplish his purposes for the sake of his church, for his people. Just as he raised Cyrus up, so the Roman Empire, even with all of its perceived might and power, ultimately has to accomplish the Lord's work for his people. We sang about that, right? In the hymn we sang, did you catch it? Um, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind the frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. He's doing his thing behind the scenes for you and for me. And that's not just on the big stage of governments like Rome and Persia, but that's in your life. The trials and tribulations he brings into your life may make you feel like what? God's frowning at me. But as the song just said, right, behind the scenes, he's smiling at what he's going to use this for, what he's going to do with this for the benefit of his kingdom and for you and for others. We don't get to see how everything works out in God's plan, but we trust that it does. Because we know he loves us. St. Paul reminds us, right, if he did not spare his own son for you, will he not give you all other things too? He knows what you need to keep you in the faith. And so he works in these mysterious ways. The Reformation was a mysterious way, right? Uh, oftentimes people will comment about, look how fractured the church is. There's so many different denominations and all these things. And they point to the frown of providence, right? They fail to see, though, with uh, the coming of the Reformation, the gospel is once again being proclaimed with its purity and all of its comforting strength. That it's all about Jesus, what he has done for you. That he has paid for all of our sins. And there's nothing we can add to that or subtract from that. And that it's a gift, and it comes from his gracious hand because of his great love for us. And so, yes, there were things that happened that were not so good, but that's how it is in this time of trials and tribulations. But God is working good even through that. And that is the proclamation of the pure gospel. And I think oftentimes for Reformation we hear, right, thank, thanks be to God that Luther rediscovers the gospel or he begins to show it in all of its clarity again. But I would like to add, I think he does that because he also rediscovers the law in all of its ramifications and what it means. Uh, but one of the criticisms against Luther was, Luther, if you teach that we're saved by grace alone, by faith alone, then no one will do any good works. Luther, you're against good works. You're against people doing the right thing. And that really seems to be a hilarious accusation if you just went through the catechism like we did. Next to the Holy Scriptures themselves, there have never been any book written so well that I would argue proclaims to you the natural knowledge of God 
and what it is the Christian is supposed to, life is supposed to look like than Luther's small and large catechisms. Because what is he doing? He's simply doing the very same thing that Jesus does with the commands as he uses them in all three of their uh, uses, right? It serves as a curb, the law does. We said it's natural to all men. We heard this, right? Cyrus knew this. The Romans knew this. All unbelievers today know the law to some extent. And it serves as a curb, just like the curb on the street, right? It keeps sin to certain bounds. But, you know, curbs are not that difficult to go over. And we're pretty good at doing it. And so, even though everybody has this written in their heart, this knowledge, God gives the Ten Commandments to remind Israel of it. And included in the Ten Commandments as he gives it to Israel is ceremonial law and other things, aspects, right? Uh, but that part that retains, even for us Christians today, of course, is the moral aspect, the thing that's written in our hearts. We all know this. This is how God has created this. And that's significant. It's significant on how we view the world and how things are going on in the world. And so we can see Cyrus as an example of God using something that Luther would call the kingdom of the left. So he talks about the, God's right-hand kingdom and his left-hand kingdom. The right-hand kingdom is what? The church, the proclamation of the gospel and God's holy word there. Okay, and that's uh, how he works among his sheep. Sheep, what is the church? Sheep who hear the shepherd's voice. The church. But the kingdom of the left, he's still working there through what he's written in everyone's hearts, the law. And so when we argue with the the, uh, the world about things in the government, we're are arguing from the basis of what they should know by natural knowledge. Our argument should be based on that too, by the way, folks. And um, this helps us then to, to be able to speak to them in a place where there's a common ground where we can say something to them, right? So, for example, uh, I've talked about this before, when our founding fathers said life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, there was a ranking there, too. Life is more important than the pursuit of happiness. You can pursue your happiness. And by the way, notice it's not a guarantee of happiness. It's the pursuit of happiness. You can pursue your happiness as long as it doesn't impinge upon my life or my liberty. On the other hand, you are free. You have liberty as long as it doesn't impinge upon someone. And so in our discussions on the issue of abortion, we can point out that all life is sacred and that that's the highest thing. And that, yes, it's sad when somebody has their pursuit of happiness may indeed be impacted by this unexpected pregnancy. Life still trumps your pursuit of happiness and your liberty. But if society turns those things upside down, there's a problem. God speaks through the kingdom of the left, and the church has a right to speak to him, by the way. You hear of separation of church and state. I don't like that, because that makes it sound like to the pagan world that God's not involved in the kingdom of the left, and that's not true. God is involved in everything. It's just he's involved differently. He's working differently. He's using different means. He's using the law that's written in our hearts. That law, too, though, is the foundation for the gospel, right? We talk about it as a mirror. No one needs a physician unless they know they're The law serves as a mirror and shows us our sinfulness. As you're going through the Ten Commandments, did you feel a little twinge of guilt every once in a while? You should have. It's a mirror. It shows us our sinfulness, our failure to live perfectly in God's law. And that's a good thing, because that's preparatory for us to hear what? The good news of what Christ has done for us, the gospel. And it also serves as a rule or a norm for us as Christians. We don't have to go looking for some other works to do, and Luther's all about this in large categories, right? You don't have to become a monk or a nun to be pleasing to God. But where God has placed you in life, that's a holy vocation. If you do it for the Lord, do it as if it on to the Lord. Paul makes this point, right, with slaves. He tells them, you know, not just when they're looking, but as if you're doing it for the Lord, do what you're supposed to do. And so that is true for us as Christians. 
The law reminds us, the Ten Commandments as the natural law written in our hearts, reminds us we have plenty to do. And unlike Rome, again, this was a huge uh, uh, departure. Unlike Rome, to think there's kind of two tracks to heaven, right? There's what's called precepts and what's called councils. Precepts are the Ten Commandments, and councils are like the Disney fast track pass, right? You get to go faster. You get to go heaven. And you can apply your merits because it's all merit-based. It's all this misunderstanding of earning, right? Luther makes the point, the things that Rome says as councils actually apply to all of us. We should all be chaste. And that doesn't mean celibacy, but to love and respect our husbands and wives, to treat them with honor, as we heard in the explanation of the Sixth Commandment. Um, it means obedience. Obedience to anyone the Lord places us over, not just as a monk or a nun in a religious order. And it means poverty. What does it mean by that? It means what the Augsburg Confession says about King David. He was a poor man in a rich kingdom. <coughs> what did that mean? He had wealth, but that was not his God. He didn't trust in that. He didn't rely upon that. He didn't think that, you know, that he was owed this or something. But he trusted in the rule. And so poverty applies to all Christians. We should all have that heart that does not love money. Or else the rule. We don't have to go looking for anything. The Lord has given us plenty to do in our callings and our occupations in life. And so with the Reformation comes a reorientation of what's important and what's good. Luther can say, for example, the mother who changes her, her baby's diaper doing a holy, more holy work than any Carthusian monk. Because the Carthusian monk has not been told by God to do what he's doing or had any promises about it. But the little maid, the little gal who changes her baby's diaper does. She can say, I'm doing a holy work that is greater than any work. And he says this about children obeying parents and all the things of the commandments. When we do the things the commandments say, we have a greater righteousness than anything man can come up with or anything man can do. And yet our hope ultimately not is, is not in that. Did you catch it in our hymn? That man a godly life might live. And then what does he say there, right? Uh, verse 11. God these commandments gave therein to show thee, child of man, thy sin. Mere. And make thee also well perceive how man unto God should live. Guide. Right? And then verse 12. Help us, Lord Jesus Christ, for we, a mediator have in thee, our works cannot salvation gain. They merit but endless pain to rely upon them. But rather, the law ultimately is not doing the thing it's supposed to do unless it serves its purpose of preparing us for the gospel, what Jesus has done. And that was what the Reformation was all about, focusing our hearts and our minds once again upon Jesus and his work that he continues to bestow that work through his means of grace, his word and his son. In the name of Jesus.